think this morning so far in the previous three presentations, we've really talked about where the workforce is. I, I want you to go for a moment in your head to where I think the workforce will be. So incredible shifts, you didn't know it, but you're coming into this field in a time of absolutely transformative healthcare change. It is so exciting. But for those of us who have studied the health workforce forever, it's also a scary time to try to figure out where we're going. This next set of slides is my attempt to tell you where I think we're going. And one of the things I wanted to start by saying, this work is actually funded by HRSA. One of the things that HRSA did is they actually created uh, health workforce research centers. And they, they have five of them now. And uh, UNC Chapel Hill is one of them. And our job is actually to be able to provide research for them uh, to support their work. And I want to acknowledge my collaborators. Rachel Makta is a phenomenal PhD student. If any of you all decide to go back and do a PhD, come do it with us at UNC Chapel Hill. I really love to work with PhD students. And I also working with Jackie Halliday. Um, too often, workforce research is done by geeks like me. Um, and you really need to work with frontline physicians. And so Jackie is a frontline physician who keeps me honest um, and really great collaborators. So, one of the things you're going to discover quickly is that this is a time of let a thousand flowers bloom. There are huge experiments going on right now. So there, folks are implementing patient-centered medical homes. Are you familiar with patient-centered medical home? The idea that a patient has a primary care provider and that their care is coordinated. Growth of accountable care organizations. We're going to give you a fee of a certain amount per patient, and you're going to be accountable for that person's health. CMS is doing some phenomenal work stimulating health system transformation. So all the, it's exciting times because all these experiments are going on. So people like me like to study what's happening. And one of the things that is really a bit controversial is we think we're going to fix the healthcare system, but the early evidence is a bit inconclusive. Are these patient-centered patient medical homes actually resulting in better, better care? Are we getting lower costs? The evidence is inconclusive. And of course, because I'm a workforce researcher, I look at it and I think, it's because you all aren't paying enough attention to the workforce as a cr critical element of this redesign. So I want to talk about that. So did you guys track Secretary Burwell's announcement just a little bit back is saying that by 2018, 50% of Medicare payments are going to be to value-based, risk-based payments, right? So we're moving from a system where we're paying people to do things, a fee-for-service. We'll pay you more volume to saying, hey, wait. We're going to hold you accountable for the outcomes of your patients. And some of that's going to, you're going to assume the risk of that. And so one of the things that gets really frustrating, and, and I hope I'm going to instill this in you, you're going to sit in meetings and you're going to hear, we just need to fix the payment system. That's it. Or we just need to fit, fix the delivery system. I want you to sit back and think, wait a minute, how do we need to reconfigure the workforce? So we read 110 articles so you wouldn't have to. Um, we actually uh, undertook a study to look at task shifting that's occurring in the delivery of traditional healthcare services. So we looked at all these really innovative models of care and we said, what kind of thing is going on in terms of task shifting of those traditional services? And then what new staff roles are emerging to provide these enhanced care services, patient coordination, health coaching, all these things? And then we looked at how healthcare employers are putting it all together, and I'll talk about that. And they're not, they're, they're not doing it very well because it's incredibly challenging. And then we looked at the implications of trends. Um, because I'm an academic, you have to have a method slide. Here's where your eyes can glaze over. But this is just a believe me, I know what I'm talking about slide. We actually did read over 120 uh, post-ACA uh, articles. Um, and our work was really focused on staff roles that have really are new. They're staff roles that have, uh, provide patient, direct patient care. And remember I talked to you about those staff roles that aren't just healthcare roles? They're also roles in the community, and we looked at those. Uh, we were reviewed by two investigators. Ultimately, we had 57 studies. So what workforce transformations did we find? Just get to the results. Okay, so there's ta significant task shifting is occurring in the, in the delivery of kind of traditional healthcare services. Medical assistants are morphing really fast. They're doing all sorts of neat things. They're taking patient histories. They're giving immunizations. They're providing preventive care. They're scribing. Is anyone familiar with scribing? Yeah, so scribing's really neat. So you have a medical assistant who's paired with a physician. And now that the physician's struggling and wrestling with their new electronic health record and kind of get the keys right, the medical assistant is actually able to take that on and actually scribe and do all the documentation so the physician can actually connect and contact with the patient and connect, which is really huge. And so that makes physicians happy and it makes patients happy because they're paying attention. And the MAs are doing a great job. So once you shift the MA role in a practice, what happens? 
you have to shift the nursing role. It's a domino effect. So nurses are now taking on refilling prescriptions. They're do doing a lot of the entering of the information, but they're also interpreting the information from electronic health records. They're creating care plans and providing patient education. Nurse practitioners and PAs in the most advanced practices have their own patient panels. So I don't know how many of you have an NP or PA as your primary care provider, but increasingly that's the model that we're seeing out of there. And pharmacists are really doing a lot kind of coordinating drug therapies and developing medication plans. In some states, including my own, created advanced practice pharmacists to really take on some of these roles. Sounds great. Sounds great, Aaron. What's the big problem? We don't actually pay pharmacists much. We have a little bit in Part D to provide uh, payment for providing direct patient care for pharmacists, but basically they don't have a good reimbursement stream. So here's a case in pharmacy where we're not really supporting it. So that's the traditional services, but what about these new roles? So there's all sorts of new roles that are emerging, and they may be filled by existing staff, or the, or the employer may actually hire new people. But folks, it's complicated. So some roles have similar functions, but different titles. Care coordination, transition specialists, all these folks are helping to coordinate patient care. Then you have some roles that have the same name. What's a patient navigator? Patient navigator could be somebody, if you're a cancer patient, who helps you navigate your way through the millions of specialists that you have. Or a patient navigator might help you be someone who connects with the health insurance exchange and helps you get insurance. So we're using the same titles for different roles. And then we have all these roles that in some practices are filled by nurse practitioners and others by social workers. So there's all this heterogeneity that goes on. But I want to talk to you about two dominant roles that we saw in the literature. Roles that focus on coordinating care within the healthcare system, and then these roles that I'm calling boundary spanning roles. These are roles that address the patient's care in between their visits, while they're in their home or they're in their community. So let me talk about care coordination function. Care coordination is big. So we have increased incentives to keep patients out of the hospital, right? P hospitals are being fined if you readmit. We're trying to keep you from, from getting sick. And in January, Medicare implemented a 42, member, uh, 42 payment uh, per month for managing patients uh, with two or more chronic conditions. This is huge. This is a big, this is actually now Medicare is paying for something that people were doing, but they're going to do more of now. Nurses are most often the folks doing, taking on care coordination. Um, and, but increasingly, they're being joined by pharmacists, social workers, and other behavioral health. So this is huge, care coordination. But these boundary spanning roles are really growing fast. What am I talking about when I'm talking about boundary spanning? So we traditionally think of healthcare services as a thing that happens to the patient when they go for a visit, right? But what about all the stuff between your visits? What if you're a woman in your 70s who forgot to get your mammogram? We're going to reach out to you. What if you're a diabetic patient who hasn't come in in a while? We're going to reach out to you. It's the in-between visit care to reach out to those patients who should be coming in and aren't. And why, why would a practice do that? They do that so that you don't get sick and they can manage your diabetes or they can manage your hypertension or your other chronic disease before you present with something more complicated. So we're discovering that if we push care upstream away from these face-to-face -face visits and actually manage conditions before they become serious, we lower costs. And so this is what panel managers do. Panel managers use data from electronic health records to identify these patients who haven't come in. And they may reach out to them, they may call them, they may work with a community health worker. They have a range of ways in which they meet these needs. And then there's health coaching. If there's one field that is growing really fast, it's health coaching. You have health coaches and practices who are meeting with patients to really educate them about their disease or about their medication. And often they work with social workers or other community health workers, and they engage with patients to help them self-manage their own conditions. So these are these boundary-spanning roles that we see. So we've got all these people taking on all these different tasks. We've got new roles that are called different things in different practices, or the same thing. And suddenly, employers are looking at us and saying, how do I write this into the job description? And how do I reconfigure my workflow to enable my medical assistants to do some of these things? So they are, in fact, redesigning workflows. But because there's this overlap in job titles, and we actually don't have a lot of training for these new roles, what we're seeing in practices is that physicians and nurses and others, I don't want to delegate to you because I don't know what your training was. Do you really know how to do care coordination? Are you really a panel manager? I'm not comfortable delegating to you if you don't have the training. And in fact, we can't transform our workforce without better training. 
but our education systems are not up to snuff yet. We don't have really good the care coordination curriculum or the patient coaching curriculum or the panel management curriculum or the population health management curriculum. And the other problem we see is that these workers need to retrain, but how do they retrain if I take you off out of the practice, you're not billing. So if you're in a fee-for-service model and you're not billing, your practice is training you, but they're losing money. So in fact, there's no incentive to train. Gosh, that was so uplifting. Uh, no, but in fact, we are getting there. And I want to talk to you about the ways in which the more general policy structures need to change. And I keep calling this the old school versus new school approach, but you, let, let's see how this goes. So my number one old school thing is could we please stop talking about, you know, will we have enough nurses, doctors? I think you saw those charts that I showed you. I, I think we're going to have enough. I think the issue is how do we more effectively and efficiently use the workforce we already have in the system? So this really neat work is coming out of UCSF by a guy named Bodenheimer, Tom Bodenheimer. Really impressed with his work. He says, you know, let's, let's, we're calling this a shortage, but that's the wrong name. It's a demand capacity mismatch. A lot of what people are yelling and will come to your offices talking about these primary care shortages could be reduced or completely eliminated if we reallocated responsibilities. And we see that the best practices and best healthcare systems are doing that. But whether this will be enough to meet patients' needs for care is really difficult to know. Because our projection models generally don't account for all that task shifting. We usually count noses. Oh, how many of the medical assistants, how many nurses, how many doctors. This fluidity is really challenging for us to measure, and I want to talk about that. The other thing I want you to leave with is we like to talk about providers. How many nurses, how many dentists, how many doctors, how many medical assistants. But the roles that are needed are different in different places. And what if different skill mix configurations could take on those different roles? So in your states, if you're in Idaho, the way that you may address patient needs is very different than in New York, right? Or if you're in Kansas, it might look very different from Florida. And I want to talk about the fact that there's this fluidity. So the literature that we looked at actually pinpointed the fact that this notion of plasticity. What am I talking about? Plasticity is the way that a health professional will adjust the scope of services that they provide depending on, one, the patient needs that are in front of them, but number two, who's around them. So let me give you a really good example. Who provides obstetric care in a rural community? Could be a family physician doing deliveries, could be an obstetrician, could be a certified nurse midwife. So people need to realize that a given set of services, obstetric care, trauma, chronic care, may be met by a very different configuration of, of practitioners. And so I want us and I want HRSA to move away from these models that say, we need 2,500 more general surgeons. Well, we, we, we actually do need more general surgeons. But we might need a combination of general surgeons and other folks in a community. And so we need to work towards recognizing that individual places may have very different health care needs, and, and depending on the setting, too. So don't talk about shortages. Talk about roles. The other thing is, in our work, people love to talk about redesigning the curriculum. But who's talking about retooling the 18 million people who are already in the workforce? Remember that chart I showed you? where you, you know, if you want to affect workforce policy, you're 12 years out. So you, go ahead, change the curriculum right now. And those people are going to graduate. But the numbers who graduate are so small relative to the number who are already in the workforce that it's the 18 million people already in the workforce who we need to retool. But when I'm out and I'm talking to my legislature, people love those shiny new grads. I mean, we always think we can address the physician shortage by just putting more physicians in the front end. I keep until I'm blue in the face screaming, what are we doing to retool the existing workforce? Because we're not going to get health system transformation until we get these appropriately trained workers. Another one problem is that our education system is sorely lagging behind front of care delivery. So all these experiments are going on, but our two and four year and postgraduate education systems haven't really woken up. They're still sort of in their own silos about, they're still delivering the same curriculum. And this move, we talked about this move from fee-for-service uh, to value-based payments is really shifting care from inpatient, and, and Mark talked about this as well. But we generally train the workforce in inpatient settings. He talked about the physician workforce. 
Where do nurses train inpatient? So a lot of our workforce trains inpatient and yet is going to end up practicing outpatient. And nurses are the biggest issue. We have a chunk of healthcare, large healthcare systems that want to move their nurses from the inpatient to the outpatient setting because that's where care is moving. But these nurses have only ever been educated in an inpatient setting. They've only ever practiced in an inpatient setting. And then we're going to throw them out and into a community-based physician practice and say, go do some care coordination. Go do some health education. That's not going to work. We have to really think about developing innovative interprofessional practice states in community settings, and not just for physicians, for nurses and for pharmacists and social workers. Why? So we can train them all together and they can learn how to practice as teams. And the other thing is our curriculums really do need to emphasize some of these new skills in population health, care coordination, informatics, patient engagement. Because one of the things that I think our new workforce is going to require is career flexibility. We actually don't know where the healthcare system is going. So we need our nurses and our pharmacists and others to be able to really flex with where the needs are going to go. And I love, I worked for a, a year actually doing workforce planning in England. And the NHS had this wonderful quote, you know, clinicians want well-defined career pathways that provide flexibility to change roles and settings, develop new capabilities, and alter their professional focus in response to changing healthcare environments, the needs of patients, and their own aspirations. Our system is pretty inflexible. It's very difficult to retrain in America. And so we need to develop a system through our community college system with our four-year institutions, and it's not just HHS, it's also the Department of Labor who's very actively involved in this, is to figure out a way to allow the medical assistant who wants to become a nurse to access the community college curriculum, get her RN, leave again. Oh, maybe she, you know, we have an RN who wants to become an NP. So we need to be developing much more fle flexible entry and exit points from the workforce to the education system. Point four, we do workforce planning for professions. Let's be honest. A lot of the workforce planning that occurs in this country happens with the physicians and the nurses. What if we started asking patients what they wanted from workforce planning? I would argue we'd move from health workforce planning to planning for a health workforce. So what would this mean? Patients are more concerned about the folks in their home, in their community-based settings. And they're very interested. If you ask patients what they value, they like talking to the social worker when they have complex illnesses. They really value a patient navigator. Being sick in this country is a complex, challenging thing. And if somebody's helping you through it, you value that. Your community health worker who helps you think, what is this medication? And I, I left the doctor's office, and I swear I understood it when I left, but I have no clue how, what I'm supposed to do with this. Community health workers who help patients understand that. So the other thing that we're trying to do is integrate health workforce with public health workforce. We have a whole legion of public health directors out in this country who are trying to figure out what's their role in a transformed healthcare system, and we've not done a good job engaging them. My last point is that we've workforce planned in this country for the number of people we need in hospitals and physician offices and skilled nursing facilities and long-term care facilities. But if you ask patients what they'd want, they would focus on care coordination and managing transitions. And it would really put an emphasis on those roles and functions. And, there, and this is not impossible to do. Other countries have done this. New Zealand has sat down with groups of diabetic patients and said, I want you to completely think outside of the box and tell me, along your journey as a diabetic patient, what services did you need? They don't ask, did you want to see a nurse? Did you want to see a pharmacist? They ask, what were the needs that you had and which needs were met and which weren't? And then they redesigned the workforce around those care pathways. It's good stuff. So that's the future of workforce, I hope. Thank you.